All right, so moving on, our next presenter is, uh, let me see the, uh, is Linda, is Linda Chien. And uh, uh, Linda Chien is a doctoral candidate at the University of Oxford School of Global and Area Studies. Her current research is on rural revitalization in Xi'era, China, which sits within the intersections of political economy and cultural politics. So I think another very interesting presentation is in the offing here. So I will let uh, uh, Linda introduce her topic and, and the presentation. Thank you. Great. Um, thank you, Dr. Das, for that introduction. And thank you to Hannah and Kimri for putting all this together and for bringing us all together. I've been learning so much and feel really honored to be part of this. So my presentation is The Countryside as a Reservoir of Resilience, Crisis, Nostalgia, and Return in Xi'era, China. This is based on my doctoral research on the Chinese concept of xiangchou, which I will explain throughout this presentation. So since the launch of reforms in 1978, rural migrants have served as the cheap labor to bring, build and service China's ambitious urbanization drive. As China emerged to position itself as the world's factory, it was migrant labor that worked along Fordist assembly lines to build the nation's industrial ambitions. Decades later, when China attempted to transition from an export-led to a consumption-based economy, it was also upon the backs of migrants and their scooters that serviced the day-to-day -day needs of modern urbanites in the late capitalist digital age. Consistent with global patterns of modernization, rural to urban labor migration has been an indispensable component of China's development. But China's migrant laborers have, laborers have also been dispensable. As observed by Peng Nai and Huiling Wu, China's process of proletarianization is unfinished. It has been a peculiar one because, in order to incorporate the Chinese socialist system into the global economy, Chinese authorities called on rural workers to work in the city but not to stay in the city. The resulting system has spatially separated industrial production in the cities and labor reproduction in the countryside. However, perhaps the system process does not necessarily have to be proletarianization per se nor does it have to be finished in the cities. Since the mid 2010s, there's been a concerted effort from the top down to revitalize rural economies. Regardless of these various initiatives are in the first secondary or tertiary sectors, all of this necessitates the return of capital, both human and financial. Accordingly, recent state policies and propaganda have framed the act of return as not only necessary, but noble and desirable. So contrary to being considered as backwards or unmodern, the countryside is being portrayed as a place that one might want to go to. And integral to the reframing of the countryside as desirable has been the strategic mobilization of affect. And my research focuses particularly on the Chinese concept of xiangchou. Xiangchou is defined here as a combination of nostalgia and homesickness with a touch of topophilia for the countryside. I argue that a renewed effort to encourage return migration has been critical to the Xi administration overcoming or at least mitigating various challenges throughout the 21st century. I illustrate how Xiangchou as one, is at once a structure of feeling as well as an effective political and discursive device to mobilize, articulate, and render manifest various forms of rural return. I ultimately highlight that the role of the countryside as a reservoir of resilience in challenging times, as well as the role of Xiangchou as a mobilizing force for this resilience. So China's great modernization and urbanization drive has been frequently described as having taken place at breakneck speeds. Chinese society for, certainly felt the whiplash of development as it entered the 21st century. And overall, this has created multiple anthropogenic challenges, which can be summed up as the urban disease on the one hand and the three rural issue on the other. In other words, capital overaccumulation, ecologically damaging practices, and the unequal distribution of resources have resulted in landscapes of extremes from heavily congested cities to the abandonment of entire villages. Caught in between these dual processes of overaccumulation and underdevelopment are China's massive army of migrant laborers. There is subjectivity that is constantly shuffling in between the empty and the overflowing. So it was at this developmental juncture where I argue that Xiangchou emerged strongly as a cultural trope to articulate various concerns and feelings at the popular level. For one, Xiangchou highlights the homesickness and melancholy of migrants themselves who are constantly caught in a state of in-betweenness of being neither here nor there. Although many are legally bound to rural areas because of their household registration status, some are culturally, morally, and emotionally attached to their ancestral hometowns. This attachment is evidenced by the mass exodus from cities that takes place annually during the spring festival. As Rachel Murphy explains, quote, even migrants who are permanently absent from their villages invoke the, invoke the narrative of return to escape social and moral censure for forgetting home. 
This is to say there's a strong culture of return enacted in words, actions, and feelings. It's even found in such cultural idioms as lo ye gui geng, which means fallen leaves eventually return to their roots. But beyond the migrant laborer, Xiang Chou can also be an articulation of a generalized concern for the state of rurality amongst other subjectivities across the urban rural spectrum. This even produced an entire genre of Xiang Chou literature written by established scholars who felt homesick, nostalgic, and even concerned for their own rural hometowns after having undergone various forms of urban socialization themselves. One of the most notable examples is Liang Hong's widely popular book, China in One Village. Her sociological study of her own hometown's development and left behindedness saw so much resonance because of how relatable it was to an entire generation who also retained rural roots. It was as if they could feel personal connections to the people and the landscapes described in her book. It was as if they personally knew the elders, the neighbors, the distant relatives, the changes, the sameness, and that complex feeling that is unmistakably Xiang Chou. Xiang Chou can also be used to understand some yearnings articulated by young urbanites. It can be contrasted with burnout culture and an overall disillusionment with modern city life. In this context, Xiang Chou becomes a way to frame the countryside as a romanticized place to virtually or literally go as a form to escape, as a form of escape from an age of anxiety. This is evidenced by the popularity of social media influencers such as Li Ziqi, whose di digital content portrays her rural lifestyle in an almost fairy tale-esque manner. Another example is this influencer who goes by the name Xiang Chou or Xiang Chou Shen Dan. Her videos mostly showcase her cooking and rural lifestyle with cameos from her grandmother. She has 13.6 million fans on the app Douyin. As a form of escape, Xiang Chou was also evidenced by a small but growing wave of urban youth who are turning to villages to seek out alternative lifestyles or modes of work. Recent years have seen a burgeoning of intentional communities where the countryside has become the site for people to experiment with subsistence and communal living. And to borrow from North American internet culture, Xiang Chou can mean living out one's cottage core dreams. So these various bottom up manifestations of Xiang Chou make it a structure of feeling. Yet what has been interesting about the proliferation of Xiang Chou is its adoption by the Chinese state as a fully fledged discursive tool for rural development, which I will explain now. Although Xiang Chou is a deeply rooted cultural concept whose articulation can be found in poems from ancient Chinese history, its recent prominence in public and official discourse is very much accredited to the speeches and writings of President Xi, which emphasize the top-down and centralized natures of nature of China's propaganda machinery. The most cited instance of Xiang Chou was from a speech made by Xi in 2013, where he emphasized the need for a human-centric urbanization that, quote, let citizens gaze at mountains see clear waters and keep Xiang Chou in mind. The term has since been, re been repurposed in various official publications and mass media productions, including a massive documentary series produced by CCTV called Ji Zhu Xiang Chou or Xiang Chou in Mind, and it showcases traditional Chinese villages and their culture and heritage. At its core, Xiang Chou is a personal sentiment of nostalgia and homesickness. Just as nostalgia, it's, a highly, personal, it's highly personal and it targets for the sentiment are subjective. However, once Xiang Chou was uttered, appropriated, and even produced by the highest echelons of state power, this otherwise personal and amorphous sentiment became imbued with meaning from the top down. Xiang Chou was no longer just personal. It was no longer just a structure of feeling. It was as if to say, for better or worse, Xiang Chou is a discourse for rural development. And as I will now illustrate, Xiang Chou is integral to encourage rural return in an era of revitalization. So in 2017, the Xi administration unveiled its ambitious rural revitalization strategy. As I mentioned earlier, this directly highlighted the need to not only bring industry back to small towns and villages, but, it also, but to also bring the workforce back. As much as this was a strategy to develop the countryside, it also addressed the major social cultural disparities between urban excess and rural depletion. Capital needed to be redirected out of China's swollen cities and back into shriveling rural economies. Subsequently, numerous articles appeared on state authorized websites and in academic circles relating the task of revitalization to Xiang Chou. An article entitled Let Xiang Chou Power Become the New Force for the Revolution of Industry was published in a provincial government news site, and it speaks about so-called Xiang Chou power as a reservoir of energy for revitalization. Another example is this article published on Xinhua and one, one of the central government's news sites. And it's called, There is a form of revitalization called retaining Xiang Chou. So these articles demonstrate how affect becomes instrumental in a new valuation of the countryside as a desirable place to both invest in and return to. My light just turned off. Great. 
there is no light. <laughs> and um, the language of Xiangzhou has been inseparable from tangible policies and projects for revitalization. And it also became an important tool to showcase the success of local states in their efforts, efforts to implement national level policy directives. For my doctoral research, I used the township called Xinjiang as my case study. I'll spend the last portion of this presentation illustrating how Xiangzhou was used to encourage the return of migrants to the township. Xinjiang is located in Jingren County in Zhejiang province and has historically been a migrant sending community. In line with the national pivot towards revitalization, government resources from the city down to the village levels have been invested into building up local industry since the mid 2010s. Notably, most of this was developed under a county level initiative known as Xiangzhou Industries to enrich the people. What constituted as part of the Xiangzhou in this plan was the effort to bring back skilled migrants and their capital to reinvest in their hometowns and unskilled labor to work along the new assembly lines. My last visit to Xinjiang was in 2010, or January 2020, and typical of the Spring Festival holiday, most of Xinjiang's outmigrated households and individuals had returned home by then. And as we now know, the Spring Festival is unlike any other. At the peak of China's lockdown during the pandemic, the township government issued an emotional letter through its public WeChat account. And this was the title of the letter, If One Can Go Home, Why Venture Far? The letter was a message of hope to all, but it clearly and specifically addressed its outmigrated population. It was an attempt to encourage migrants to remain and resettle in their hometowns, and it was a direct appeal to their homesickness, nostalgia, and love for their hometown. At the same time, the letter was also a strategic plea to migrants to consider working locally. This is all evidence in the following passage. So while everyone was locked in at home, this letter was an invitation to remain. And to make this invitation even more compelling, the letter also provides a generous sprinkling of photos, which portray scenes from villages within Xinjiang. These photos were accompanied by the caption, by these captions that further pulled at one's heartstrings. And it made clear the message that while out migrated, they leave behind loved ones who are considered the left behind or those who hold down the fort. This passage here emphasizes the revitalization efforts and how the return of industry again necessitates the return of labor. The key takeaways here are the quantification of development, the emphasis, emphasis on the improved living environment in the township, and notably that many of these industries have in fact been employing migrants from other presumably poor regions. And this paragraph was immediately followed by these photos. And here we see presumably of rural subjectivities working in new factories. And so throughout the letter, themes of Xiangzhou are plentiful and only to further drive this message home, the following is written. Back then you left with your backs turned to your native homes. You went out to hustle with the sole intention of returning to live a better life. Back then the hometown was too small and it did not have the capacity to hold your dreams. But today your hometown of Jingring is a place of natural beauty and a place ripe for investment. If you can come home, why venture far? So from the basin of revolution to the reserve army of labor, I argue that the discourse of Xiangzhou is now helping to materialize another role for the countryside vis-a-vis -vis China ongoing development. That goal is to redirect capital into the countryside, which in this view can be considered a new frontier for development. From the perspective of government policy, the utility and underlying logic behind the state-led push for urban to rural migration and the injection of capital into the countryside can be understood partly as the dull compulsions of economic relations. It is the continued subjection of the laborer to the capitalist, but now on the soil of migrants' very own rural hometowns or in other rural areas. However, this is not to say that the peasantry and the countryside have only been passive tools in Chinese state's agenda. Desires of Xiangzhou are genuine and also have bottom-up resonance. In my case study, I was able to interview some returnees who expressed gratitude for opportunities to work at home and for no longer needing to be a migrant laborer. Although whether or not the county's Xiangzhou Industries plan can actually enrich the people still remains to be seen. Overall, it was upon the concept of Xiangzhou where varying strands of interest, including top-down forces and bottom-up sentiments that intersected and intertwined. Xiangzhou is at once a structure of feeling to articulate various concerns and desires in an age of anxiety and a discursive tool to mobilize rural return and deploy rural developmental policies from the top down in a bid to revitalize the countryside. Through the discourse of Xiangzhou, this impetus and enactment of return can be understood both as the dull compulsions of economic relations and what I call the affective devotion of cultural attachments. Perhaps it is Xiangzhou that helps tether the hundreds of thousands of migrants to the rural hometowns and even the entire Chinese nation states to its rural roots. Perhaps Xiangzhou is a source of resilience that can not only mobilize for return, but also reconcile the urban rural divide. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Linda. That was incredibly, I mean, fascinating. I think this is 
such an interesting and it's a, it's a hard topic to i mean deal with i think so i commend you on doing such a brave dissertation you know and uh, um uh, in comments again you can address this probably later on right so i just had some i mean uh, i would have learned I'd like to know a little bit more about your methods for example right you did allude at the very end that you did interviews but until that point it was not very clear as to whether you were doing this like uh, i mean you were reading text and then doing it or was it like real field work so anyway i'm sure you can explain that um the other thing is like uh, so it, it's very fascinating because i uh, you know this shanto concept i mean so yes i mean there is probably this nostalgia that was there among migrants who left and you know so people have written about that i'm sure in the literature and stuff like that but the way the state is using it is a very different tactic you know and later on you mentioned i mean because i mean this this is a huge problem in china i mean you mentioned that very quickly at the end i mean the the problem of left behind children and elderly for example i mean literally millions and millions of households experience this right so and it almost seems like that the letter from the government is saying that yeah yeah come back you know it's almost like blaming them that hey why did you leave your parents and children behind it was because of the incentives and the disincentives created by the state that led to that right so also so that's one aspect so how how do people reconcile this how are they looking at this right i mean the the people's self sort of i mean or the people's own sentiment of chancho versus what is being sort of orchestrated or sort of created and finally one more interesting point that i i mean i mean that i found very interesting was uh how how satisfying is this i mean shangchu once you return are they returning to the same thing i don't think so right i mean it, it's not just going back to the place the space is different the economy is different i mean people the, the state itself is probably doing something which is totally different i mean you know the economy is very different the space has changed right so is it just i mean so it, it seems difficult to sort of think that i mean it's it's difficult i mean to sort of experience the same loss or whatever i mean the sense that you had of whatever it was before right so how do people or i mean what is happening when people go back i mean are they i mean are they happy or sad you know i mean what are the sentiments because i don't think it's the same place in the space and the community that they go back to almost right so anyway so these are some thoughts that came to mind which i think are very fascinating and i would like you to be able to sort of talk a little bit more about those when you i mean do so after the okay so so thank you it was really really interesting so the our next uh, presenter is nancy g and uh, she is a, a doctoral candidate at keio university nancy's area of research examines contemporary japanese architecture and its role in community regeneration so i'll also hand over the i mean proceedings to her now and she can introduce her topic to you thank you can you hear me now we can hear you okay i think maybe when i try to share full screen sometimes zoom acts up but I'll go from here. Thank you we so can, much. We can we can hear you now. Yeah, we can hear you now. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much for the introduction and thank you organizers um, for giving me the opportunity to present today. So I'll be presenting rural creativity and resilience a small island community in Japan. So when people think of rural Japan, I think this type of landscape may come to mind, a very picturesque and quaint village among mountains with nicely preserved traditional wooden houses and rice paddies. However, most of rural Japan is actually far from this image of a serene and beautifully created landscape. This picture taken on one of my field work trips is more in line with what is actually happening in many rural areas which are decaying and declining. Currently, there are over 8 million vacant houses, with many of which are in rural areas. One of the main causes in an aging is an aging and decreasing population which directly contributes to social and economic decline. The population peaked about 10 years ago and has been steadily decreasing ever since. So Japan's rural areas experience more severe effects of this depopulation as younger people move to bigger cities for better education and career career moves and most do not return leaving only elderly residents. and um i think it's a little different to countries like china is actually um the children there's not many children at all and it seems that japan's areas have a bleak and a certain feature which is currently one of the biggest challenges for the japanese government 
So while cities have been the attention of many scholars and researchers, it has been a renewed interest in rural areas in recent years. Architect Room Kohlhaus recent exhibition at the Guggenheim titled Countryside the Future showcased examples around the world where the countryside can be a fertile ground for development and experimentation. Um, to frame the research, I'm looking at theories relating to post-growth and this current shift in mentality and lifestyle choices by Japanese youth who are no longer promised a job or stable employment. So what kind of alternative lifestyles will the next generation choose in the post-growth Japan? Currently, rural revitalization in Japan is a mix of top-down and bottom-up approaches. Um, for my research, I'm interested in the bottom-up, the often informal, temporary, small-scale, and low-cost, low-tech amateur responses, um, which also deserve to be studied in addition to top-down structural reform. And I'm also drawing on my background as an architect to study how the rural is being remade in both a physical and tangible sense in addition to social changes. And this timeline shows key events and initiatives which have shaped the rural um, and the current focus I'm going to be studying is from the 2000s until the present, as from this point in time it marked a shift um, in Japanese rural revitalization to a more creative based and socially engaged practices and often increased interest from city dwellers to migrate to rural areas, especially after the 2011 earthquake. In the early 2000s, um, a small collection of islands was host to a major art festival called the Situati Triennale. Um, it, this has since been gone on to be held every three years and become a very uh, popular tourist destination. So one of the main islands is called Naoshima. Um, it has a lot of different artworks and sculptures out in the open, as well as art museums and hotels. So this was seen as a kind of revival or transformation where creativity together with tourism has managed to attract many visitors to these remote islands to boost, boost local industry. And many vacant houses have also been tastefully transformed by very acclaimed well-known architects into contemporary art galleries to showcase their works. The population of Naoshima Island was only about 3,000, yet the number of visitors and uh, recent years have exploded since art, art festival started, especially since the main museum was built um, in 2004. So during the most recent 2019 edition before the pandemic, the total number of visitors um, reached over 1 million to the whole um, Situichi area. And then I think um, all these uh, visitors um, I guess boosted local industry, there's a lot of new shops open, a lot of migrants came, a lot of cafes and guest houses. And it's really interesting to note that the aesthetics of these new developments are not dissimilar to um, the urban or what you might find in Tokyo or other cities. They're, you know, hip vegetarian restaurants, hand drip coffee and even lamping. So this image of the rural is being remade. And then as we know, COVID came and halted international travel um, in Japan since April until now. So movement within Japan has also um, slowed down and the island which once was bustling is now quiet and many businesses have struggled. Um, and since most of the businesses de depend on tourists, especially in high seasons, it became clear that tourism was not a sustainable um, way and should not be overly reliant on for revitalization. So as part of um, my study, I decided to um, focus on some other islands nearby, um, some other communities that had not depended so heavily on art or tourism to see how they were doing, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic. The case study area is in the south of Japan, about 10 hours drive from Tokyo. Um, and I wanted to um, try to guess, trace or try to find examples of rural, rural creativity and to understand how and by whom um, again, this sort of new image of the rural is being remade. Where I showed before Naoshima and my current place of residence and field work area is um, around Kamijima to the east. So a popular cycling route was built to connect some of these islands um, called the Shinanami Kaido. Um, this is a view of the islands. And the Shinanami Kaido um, cycling route connects the islands um, 
which is also uh, rising in popularity and boosting local tourism. But the towns that I'm studying, they view tourism as a, uh, the main goal is to see tourism as a gateway to migration rather than just to attract visitors. So the island um, of Kamijima um, comprises um, of 25 islands, seven of which are inhabited. And I think similar to many other parts of rural Japan, population is steadily declining. Um, there's currently about six and a half thousand people across the seven inhabited islands. And the largest island is comparable to Naoshima Art Island with about 3,000 people. So my method for the study was both um, physical and virtual ethnographic work. Um, adapting to the um, coronavirus as well as I was unable to come back to Japan for all of last year. So I conducted mainly um, physical field work prior in 2019 and this year and also online field work in um, the form of online interviews um, all of 2020. So I talked to about 20 island residents to talk about their life and work, um, why they came to the island, why they stayed on the island and impacts of COVID-19 and there was a mix of ages from 20s to 70s um, engaged in different forms of businesses from restaurant owners, cafe, guest house owners and freelance workers. So I'll just show three um, different profiles to give you an idea of the um, type of activities happening here on the islands. Um, the first is a bakery that was renovated from an old folk house by a couple with their um, two children who are in their 40s. The wife runs a bakery um, and the house was inherited from her grandfather. And although she didn't spend her childhood on the island, she moved to um, the city with her parents. She returned about 10 years ago to live with her family. And now they run the cafe and bakery here. Yeah. As a response to COVID-19, um, the bakery had to close for two months and her income decreased drastically um, during the lockdown from April to June. But other than that, she said her life hasn't been affected much as she used the downtime to prepare a mobile bakery, which she has used to visit different areas around the island and also surrounding islands. And these are some photos taken on a recent um, trip that I went with her to one of the least populated islands with only about 140 people. And there was also a supermarket, mobile supermarket that I was visiting on the same day. So these kind of services um, weren't actually existent before the pandemic. So it was kind of seen as a um, almost like a blessing in disguise that people's lives were becoming more convenient with these more um, mobile services. And she plans to come back um, about once a month to visit this island. And she's also making extra income from renting her living room space, which is in a very um, nicely renovated oak house for small events such as yoga classes. And she's quite tech savvy and uses social media to announce her like events and schedules to connect with customers. Um, the bakery itself is still open a few days a week at the moment and the space in front of it has been used as a social space for the immediate neighborhood, including like outdoor gatherings and social events. Um, the second is a cafe and organic farm run by a couple who had moved from Tokyo after experiencing the Great East Japan earthquake which made them realize their over-dependency on service city, and they decided to live in the rural areas to become more self-sufficient and grow their own food. They also renovated a vacant house um, themselves. During the COVID-19 pandemic, the wife started to transition to online means to continue to engage with the community over food. She did a range of like cooking videos. Um, and I think, yeah, just the idea that a lot of these migrants are, you know, they're quite well educated. They've worked in Tokyo, um, and they're quite tech savvy and she's managed to teach some of the elderly people how to use this new technology. And the last example is a guest house owner um, on one of the smaller islands with 400 people. So it's another traditional house um, renovated by many local volunteers um, and two local ladies have to manage the guest house as the owner is still located in Tokyo. And this usually is really popular on Airbnb and is usually booked out. But during the um, pandemic also, they had to close for a few months and they started to um, branch out into um, joining um, sort of remote, uh, this kind of shift into remote working. So they join a program um, called HAFU, which is Home Away From Home, that targets workcation and tries to attract um, workers from cities who might 
um, be working remotely and wants to relocate even temporarily to rural areas and work and live at the same time. So this um, company called Hafu has uh, is a local Japanese company that's also expanded overseas recently. And it's a, basically like a subscription service where you can pay a monthly fee and get to stay in any of the um, guest houses on their list. And the guest house owner also recently received some grant money to re renovate another nearby existing house, um, which is envisioned to be a place for remote working and those interested to migrate um, to stay for short to long term. And recently a high school student was organizing a flea market to sell all the goods found um, in the house. And I think it's a really great example of local community coming together, raising awareness and trying to reuse existing resources. Yeah, this is my last slide, just to try to tie back to the um, themes of the conference. I think it's really relevant, the idea of local innovation, adaption, and resilience. And I think through my research so far, um, I've only been here for three months, but I think this really getting to um, realize the important role of migrants um, and their role in revitalization. Like I said before, they're often well educated from the cities, have overseas living, studying experience, and they have this. Um, DIY attitude, whereas rather than relying on top-down assistance, um, they're engaging in things themselves, such as renovating vacant houses and creating jobs as their lack of job opportunities. They have started um, you know, their own businesses and become entrepreneurs in their own right. And the idea of like, being small and sustainable, um, um, there's more interest in self-sufficiency, like growing their own vegetables and also finding this work-life balance. I think it's a vital ingredient maybe to overcome COVID-19 and they don't have any staff to pay. And most people I've talked to here, their life hasn't really been affected too much um, compared to the cities. And so this idea of being agile and adaptable in terms of crisis, I think um, from this, at least from the three examples I've shown, um, the idea of being able to go mobile, closing the distance between um, product, service and people, finding alternative work and being flexible with working options and times, and using technology and social media to stay connected and um, reach new customers. So to conclude, rural areas um, have had less impact than city. There's less financial pressure due to low living costs and really cheap rents, um, stronger social networks, closer communities, people just sharing vegetables and um, you know, having that sort of more personal connection and not depending on one type of work for a living and being flexible and have a diversification of income streams. Um, and lastly, local knowledge and responses to COVID um, in rural Japan, I think, can also be a valuable lesson to understand self-sufficiency and an alternative to city life, which could potentially offer insights into what this idea of deep growth in contemporary post-Japan could be. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. That was, again, a very, very interesting and insightful presentation. Um, I would like to disclose that actually I am an architect by training, so I really enjoyed this um, this presentation. And if um, uh, I mean, there's there's a lot of similarity between the last presentation and yours because, but it, they're also very distinct because the impulses and the incentives and the implications are quite different. So I would like you to speak a little more to that if you, I mean, uh, after again towards the end of the session. Uh, but a couple of things that I would like to, I mean, uh, which, which struck me and, you know, uh, I would like to learn more from you are like, uh, say, what is happening, uh, you know, with all this that's going on, I mean, people trying to move, I mean, move into the rural areas and sort of, you know, revitalize the stag stagnating sort of rural economies uh, in relation to, let's say, the built heritage of, um, of, the, of the villages in Japan, right? So, uh, especially in terms of, let's say, um, from an architect standpoint, I mean, is there the skill level there to actually continue building, say, vernacular Japanese architecture, or rural architecture, I would say, um, are there craftspeople who do that, right? And so that's one side of the story. The other side is, I mean, when you have a lot of money coming in and sort of trying to, whatever, scale up, say, the, the tourism industry, so that's changing probably the, I mean, the landscape, the built landscape. So how do people look at it, right? So who are the migrants who are coming in? Are they a particular demographic? I mean, are people who have sort of made the money and now want to retire back? Are these young people who are trying to come? Uh, how do the 
local people look at the migrants, right? So, and which art or craft, which creative industries, I mean, that are there in rural uh, Japanese society are better suited to maybe um, to straddle these two different worlds or sort of transition to this new world. Uh, uh, so these are some, I mean, very interesting questions that I think I, I had just from, I mean, listening to your presentation. So I'm sure you, you know about these things. So I would like to learn a little more if we have time after this, yeah? So anyways, an excellent presentation. Very, very nice. Thank you. Linda or Nancy, do you want to go next? Yeah, I could go next. Um, just to respond to your question on methodology. So yeah, there's, um, I actually did field work in a village in, called Heyang, which is based in Xinjiang Township. And I stayed there for several months. And it's interesting um, hearing Nancy's uh, project after mine, since it, uh, it's a village that does rural tourism and they brand it as Xiangshou tourism. And so there I just did a lot of um, interviews with uh, local cadres and, um, entrepreneurs and also local villagers and tour guides. And it was interesting, one question I asked all of them is what does Xiangchou mean to you? And everyone answered very differently. And what was most notable was how um, villagers themselves would say, oh, I don't have Xiangchou. That's something the government says. So that was like really fascinating to me. So that kind of blends into your second question of like, how does Xiangchou, how is it reconciled from top down and bottom up? And in a way it's not reconciled at all. And for a lot of villagers, they felt that Xiangchou was, it's just, it doesn't belong to them. And it's something that urban tourists come and um, experience. It's government imposed on them, but they don't have Xiangchou anymore. And um, I'm sure many other village, and it's funny too, because this village, they always say like, we want to emulate the nice rural tourism villages like in Japan, because they do it very well. But um, there isn't a lot of uh, participation, bottom-up participation, because the state is more strong. And so because of that, too, um, as you're asking whether or not when people do come back, if things are the same or different, most people haven't actually come back to this village because there's still nothing to do for them because um, they can't really participate in the tourism effort or the revitalization effort, for that matter. And if they do want to come back, it would be to work in the factories like in Xinjiang Township. And that's not ultimately very desirable for a lot of people because wages are still low. And it also brings up the question of when they do, if they do go back, then household chores would be divided. It's very gendered then. And so for women, it would be very different than for men. And that's um, those are a lot of topics I do explore in my thesis. And I think across China, like not this village, re revitalization has worked in some places in terms of Xiangchou and um, especially where conditions allow some agriculturally based places have done pretty well and had way more government funding to bring like technology, um, using drones to like plant better crops and stuff like that. So that has worked out. And um, within my county, um, a lot of youth have found success in e-commerce and that wouldn't have been as feasible prior to, you know, the past few years where the government's invested more or local governments have invested more in like digital infrastructure and stuff like that. So um, yeah, Xiangchou has been a bit of a mixed bag and at least in my case study, not very beneficial so far. There hasn't been that much. Linda, I presume you did your field work before the pandemic, right? Yeah, yeah. I was... maybe, maybe during the pandemic, some people have gone back. So maybe if you visit again, you might find some some returnees, you know, and so that might maybe add some more richness or complexity to your, and I mean, it's an ongoing project. So I think it's very fascinating. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Let's see if Nancy or Azania want to, I mean, add something. Or... Yeah, maybe I'll try to answer some of the questions. I did some in the chat, but I'm just trying to answer maybe Karen's um asking for some advice or tips so i thought it was quite interesting the whole i think method of doing ethnography both virtually and in the field has been i think something all of us have been trying to react to with the pandemic and i think from my experience um i tried to do my best and try to study i did like a short field trip visit before the pandemic to sort of um get some key contacts but weren't really familiar the site at all and then spent all of last year just reading and trying to contact people um, via like social media I think that's really useful and they a lot of I think um, 
urban to rural migrants, they document their life really well. I'm not sure if it's just in Japan, but they post to Instagram and like write blogs and there's a wealth of information on there. Um, and then I think the, the type of information and the depth of information I was able to get online still can't really be compared to actually being here. So I've been here since January um, after returning to Japan and really got to know the people um, almost like as friends, I guess it's always the case you start to, I guess, build trust. And um, I think I've got to, yeah, just get a lot more personal information and less generic type answers. I think it's still really important if you can to try come here physically, at least for a few months, I think. Um, it's yeah, just completely different level of information I was able to gain from talking online for a one hour interview as opposed to like, you know, always visiting the cafe, talking to them on a day to day basis and seeing also the changes that have happened and the changes to their thinking as well. Um, so maybe that's, yeah, I think it's really good that you're able to come, Karen. <laughs> and then any tips, I think, um, I think participating like in the events and activities and not just asking questions. So I think not just, you know, sitting down and having kind of formal interview, but I think the more informal exchanges and um, has been really helpful. I have been able to find a lot of um, just friends of friends who have become informants as well. But so building kind of this network um, of, you know, I think all the migrants are quite closely connected in rural areas and it's really good to sort of see how, I guess, how they approached, how they've navigated their social lives as well has been really interesting. So just being open and I think building Building trust as a first step has been really important. I basically didn't really worry too much about, you know, trying to find the right kind of information in the first month or two. It's just about settling in and going to visit people, saying hi, and sort of explaining what I was, where I was coming from, and you know, being a foreign scholar and why I was interested in rural Japan. And a lot of people were also really interested to kind of know why I was interested in what they were doing. So it's kind of a mutual kind of um, exchange. So that's been really good. Okay. We are definitely out of time here. So I, I think I just wanted to make one comment before ending this, uh, because uh, this was aptly, very aptly named resilience in Asia, but I think it makes a very important contribution in, to resilience studies and understanding in general. Resilience is a very policy oriented sort of an approach, right? So it has this sort of list of kind of do's and don'ts and it recognizes elements. I think what your presentations have shown that, you know, the more material things that we kind of identify and expect to sort of contribute towards resilience are not necessarily that important in many of these cases. And there are these non-material things which we don't think about, which definitely are very important thing. I mean, parts of people's lives and communities' lives, which actually seem to bear and carry much more resilience, you know? And so that's a very interesting contribution. So I, you're all young scholars. I wish you all very, the best, you know, and so that, uh, you know, publish widely. And I think it's going to have a big impact on, you know, how we see the world and how we deal with resilience. So again, thank you, Hannah and Kimari, for this wonderful opportunity. I really enjoyed the session and the presentation. So I wish everyone good luck. Thank you.